Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I quickly want to make a video about the books that I'm taking with me to school. Um, I'm going to be a sophomore in college and enjoy reading when I have time. These are the books that I will be taking with me. Going in no particular order, we have Victorian People and Ideas, a companion for the modern reader of Victorian literature by Richard D. Atlick. Altic. Richard D. Altic. And um, I'm taking a Victorian literature course and I thought this might be something that would be fun and interesting to have. Um, I picked this up at a library book sale. There are pictures and different things. Then I have The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy and she, I think, is, this is, um, this won the Man Booker Prize and she's shortlisted or longlisted for the Man Booker this year. I'm then taking, this is a very exciting book, The Norton Anthology of English Literature, um, The Victorian Age, Volume E. This is one that I had for one of my classes last semester that I was at school and need for my Victorian class. I then am taking All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. I'm making my way through Anthony Doerr's works. This is the last one I have of his bibliography to read. Marie Lar lives with her father in Paris near the Museum of Natural History, where he works as the master of its thousands of locks. When she is six, Marie Lar goes blind and her father builds a perfect miniature of their neighborhood so she can memorize it by touch and navigate her way home. When she is 12, the Nazis occupy Paris and father and daughter flee to the walled citadel of St. Malo where Marie Lor Marie Lor's reclusive great uncle lives in a tall house by the sea. With them they carry what might be the museum's most valuable and dangerous jewel. In a mining town in Germany, an the orphan Werner grows up with his younger sister, enchanted by a crude radio they find. Werner becomes an expert at building and fixing these crucial new instruments, a talent that wins him a place at the Brutal Academy for Hitler Youth. Then a special assignment to track the resistance. More and more aware of the human cost of his intelligence, Werner travels through the heart of the war and finally into St. Into Saint Malo, where his story and Marie Lors converge. Dor's stunning sense of physical detail and gorgeous metaphors are dazzling. Deftly interweaving the lives of Marie Lore and Werner, he illuminates the ways against all odds, people trying to be good to one another. Ten years after in ten years in the writing, all the light we cannot see is a magnificent, deeply moving novel from a writer whose sentences never fail to thrill. So this won the Pulitzer Prize, and I'm a huge fan of Anthony Dorr's writing. Next, I have Sexing the Cherry by Jeanette Winterson. In a fantastic world that is and is not 17th century England, a baby is found floating in the, in the Thames. The child is rescued by the dog woman, a murderous gentle giant who names her newfound trophy Jordan and takes him out for walks on a leash. When he grows up, Jordan, like Gulliver, travels the world but finds that the strangest wonders are spun around, are spun out of his own head. The oddest wonder of all is time. Does it exist? What is its nature? Why does every journey conceal another journey within its lines? What is the difference between 7th century Jordan and 20th century Nicholas Jordan, a naval cadet on a warship? And who are the 12 dancing princesses? In a story full of shimmering epiphanies, Winterson demonstrates the keenness of her craft and the singularity of her vision. I then have Secret Lives of Great Artists by Elizabeth Lundy. With outrageous anecdotes about everyone from Leonardo, alleged sodomist, to Caravaggio, convicted murderer, to Edward Hopper, alleged wife beater, Secret Lives of Great Artists recounts the seamy, steamy, and gritty history behind the great masters of international art. You'll learn that Michelangelo Michelangelo's body odor was so bad his assistants couldn't stand working for him, that Vincent van Gogh um, sometimes ate paint directly from a, the tube, and that Georgia O'Keeffe loved to paint in the nude. This is one art history lesson you'll never forget. Another book about art is Art as Therapy by Alain de Botton and John Armstrong. 
With the hardback of bestseller worldwide, this passionate, thought-provoking, often funny, and always accessible book proposes a new way of looking at art, suggesting that it can be useful, relevant, and therapeutic. Through practical ex examples, the authors argue that certain great works of art hold clues as to how to manage the tensions and confusions of modern life in four chapters that cover love, nature, money, and politics. I then have this little book on being different, what it means to be a homosexual by Merle Miller. Originally published in 1971, On Being Different is a pioneering and thought-provoking book about being gay in America. Just two years after the Stonewall Riots, Miller wrote an essay for the New York Times magazine entitled What It Means to Be Homosexual in response to a homophobic article in Harper's Magazine. Miller's writing, described as the most widely read and discussed essay of the decade, along with an afterward chronicling his inspiration and readers' responses, became On Being Different. One of the earliest memoirs to affirm the importance of coming out, this updated edition includes a foreword by Dan Savage and an afterword by Charles Kayser to highlight the impact of Miller's classic work. We then have What We See When We Read by Peter Mendelssohn. What do we see when we read? Did Tolstoy really describe Anna Karenina? Did Melville ever tell us what exactly Ishmael looked like? The collection of fragmented images on a page a graceful ear here, a stray curl there, a hat position just so, and other clues and signifiers help us to create an image of a character. But in fact, our sense that we know a character intimately has very little to do with our ability to con concretely picture these literary figures. figures. When James Joyce invites us to Dublin, when Charles Dickens sets us down in London, we, become, we come to know these cities specifically through their filters. We graft mental maps of familiar places onto the fictional locales of these writers, thus exploring with a through-the-looking-glass sensibility worlds and eras we've likely never visited. These visual proce this visual process, argues acclaimed graphic artist Peter Mendelssohn, is like no other. It is entirely specific to the process of reading. In this remarkable exploration a gorgeously unique, fully illustrated phenomenology. Mendelssohn combines his professional experience as an award-winning designer, his first vocation as a classically trained pianist, and his first love, literature, into what is sure to be one of the most provocative and unusual investigations into how we understand the act of reading. Next, I'm taking The Heart by Malie de Carangal. Just before dawn, on a Sunday morning, three teenage boys go surfing. While driving home exhausted, the boys are involved in a fatal car accident on a deserted road. Two of the boys are wearing seatbelts, one goes through the windshield. The doctors declare him brain dead shortly after arriving at the hospital, but his heart is still beating. The heart takes place over the 24 hours surrounding the resulting heart transplant, as life is taken from a young man and given to a woman close to death. In gorgeous, ruminative, prose, it examines the deepest feelings of everyone involved as they navigate decisions of life and death. As stylistically audacious as it is emotionally explosive, the heart mesmerized readers in France, where it has been hailed as a breakthrough work of, new liter of a new literary star. With the precision of a surgeon and the language of a poet, de Carangal has made a major contribution to both medicine and literature with an epic tale of grief, hope, and survival. Then I'm taking with me Murder on the Orient Express by um, Agatha Christie. Just after midnight, the famous Orient Express is stopped on its tracks by a snowdrift. By morning, the millionaire Samuel Edward Ratchet lies dead in his compartment, stabbed a dozen times, his door locked from the inside. One of the fellow passengers must be the mur murderer. Isolated by the storm, Detective Her Hercule Poirot forgive my mispronunciation, must find the killer among a dozen of the dead man's enemies before the murderer decides to strike again. So this is becoming a movie this year, I believe, I think in the fall. So this will be fun to read. Next, I'm taking with me The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. The Return of the Native, both powerful and somber, 
is sometimes considered the most representative of Hardy's novels. It tells the story of Eustacia Vi, Thomason, and Mistress Eubright, and the men who influence and alter the li their lives. Degree Venn, the Rettleman, Damon Wildev, and the returning native, Clem Yeobright. It is set in Egdon Heath, whose lowering titanic presence dominates the men and women who live upon it, and whose menace and beauty Hardy so surely and superbly evokes. Against this changing backdrop, that represents the impersonal forces and external verities that manipulate us all, the fate of beautiful, passionate Eustacia and the others are inexorably played out as Eustacia despairing, despairingly cries, I was capable of much, but I have been injured and blighted and crushed by things beyond my control. So many names. And lastly, two YA novels that I I'm sure I will enjoy when I want something a little bit less adult literary between my studies and such. I have How I Live Now by Meg Rossoff. New Yorker Daisy is sent to live in the English countryside with cousins she's never even met. When England is attacked and occupied by an unnamed enemy, the cousins find themselves on their own. Power fails, systems fail. As they grow more isolated, the farm becomes a kind of Eden with no rules until the war arrives in their midst. Daisy's is a war story, a survival story, a love story, all told in the voice of a subversive and witty teenager. This book crackles with anxiety and with lust. It's a stunning and unforgettable first novel that captures the essence of, a, of the age of terrorism, how we live now. And then I have Daughter of Zanadu by Dory Jones Yang. Athletic and strong-willed, the bold and beautiful princess Emogen, Emogen is determined to do what no woman has ever done before, become a warrior in the army of her grandfather, the great Khan Kublai. In the world of the Mongols, the only way to earn respect and achieve independence is to show bravery and win glory on the battlefield. The last thing Emogen wants is to be distracted by a charming foreigner, but that's exactly what happens in the lush gardens of Zanadu at the Khan's summer palace where Imogen spends time with Marco Polo, the man who will challenge all her goals and beliefs. A traveling merchant, Marco has no skill in the three manly arts of the Mongols, horse racing, archery, and wrestling. Still, he charms the Khan with his wit and gift for storytelling. Traveling across China with Marco, who is on a secret mission for the Khan, Imogen sees a different side of this intriguing foreigner, one that is adventurous and resourceful. Together, Imogen and Marco face wild creatures in the bamboo forests, hunt dragons, and encounter fierce warriors mounted on elephants. At the same time, Imogen struggles with her forbidden attraction to Marco and her nearly impossible goal of winning fame as a soldier. So these are the books that I'm planning on taking with me to school that I'm hoping I'll read in the next year or so. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you in another video.